So broadly speaking, computers are combinations of hardware and software. The hardware is anything that you can pick up, and the software is anything that you can't pick up. When you download an app from the App Store, that's software. The thing that you're holding in your hand is the hardware. What does hardware consist of? Displays, and input devices, output devices, things like that. So we're going to go and say, what is hardware divvied up into? Input, output, processing, and storage. I'm still thinking this light's too bright. So what is input? I know everybody knows what input is, but what is input? It's the act of giving information in to the, into the system. Typing on the keyboard, input. Using a mouse pointer is input. Touching on a touch sensitive screen is input. Speaking into a voice activated system. Here I'm gonna try an experiment. Hey Google, nobody's phone turned on. Hey Siri. Well, mine did anyways. All right, so voice input. Because otherwise, without input, you just have a block of, you know, of glass and, and metal that's, you know, displaying pretty pictures on it. Doesn't do anything useful. Then output. Output is whatever the computer does in order to convey information back to you whether it's play beeps or sounds, you know, through speakers or to, you know, display stuff on the screen. That's output, you know, send things to a printer. Nowadays, the, uh, the, the categories are, you know, kind of blurred because you interact more often now with things that have both input and output combined on one thing, you know, the, the touch screen, than anything else, pretty much, on your phones and on your tablets. So processing, what is processing? Well, underneath it all, what's happening is that you have a device which is sitting there iterating through a series of numbers over and over and over. That's really all the computer is doing is iterating through a series of numbers. Now the numbers mean something to the computer. They're very important to it. But it's just sitting there going through a series of numbers incredibly fast, three billion you know, per second or whatever, and then it's making decisions. If you touch this, then I want you to do this. You know, if, then things. While the button, while you have your finger on the screen, light this part of the screen red, you know, while conditions. Uh, take these two fields and add them together to display the results. Look up what they've typed in as a phone number and make sure it's a valid phone number, that it doesn't have too few digits. That kind of thing. That's all processing. Um, data processing, um, you know, running through, you know, a whole bunch of payroll records in order to print checks or you know, text processing. I had a professor, not a professor, a high school instructor who just hated the word text processor. But I'm not processing, I'm writing. But okay, yeah, you know, you know what text processing is. It's taking numbers off the hard drive displaying those numbers as English letters and words, allowing you to rearrange those and add new ones and then saving it back to the hard drive as numbers. So that's processing. And the f when I just said loading and saving, that it kind of implies the last thing here, storage. I don't like the fact that I put the word storage here and then a storage again as a, a, a subheader under it. That was kind of dumb. <clears throat> but Broadly speaking, you know that when you're going out shopping for a computer that you can buy it with a certain amount of RAM installed, eight gigabytes or whatever, and then <clears throat> that it also has, you know, some kind of hard drive, or likely nowadays it may have a solid state hard drive, which doesn't have a spinning, you know, platter in it, but still the same idea is you have the temporary storage, which gets reset if you turn your computer off, and then you have your slower storage, which is supposed to maintain its state, even when the computer's turned off. And the temporary storage is supposed to be very fast. The, the permanent storage, the semi-permanent storage, is slower. And then as you start to blur the lines between them with the solid state hard drives, you know, anything that had to be read from a whirling platter, like a hard drive, a physical media, is going to be slower than something that can be read, you know, 
silicon transistors. So if you get solid state drives in your computers, you know, they do work faster. These things don't have hard drives in them. They don't have floppy drives. It's all, you know, it's all transistors and silicon nowadays. But uh, still, the idea persists. You know, you pick up your phone, it's got a certain number of gigabytes of RAM, and then it's got a certain number, you know, of gigabytes. I think I'm calling them gigabytes of RAM. What does a phone no normally have? Like two gigabytes now? Anyways, and then, you know, maybe 128 gigabytes of storage or whatever has flash RAM. So anyways, what is that used for? Well, this, and earlier programming terms would have been called the store. What does that mean? Well, that's where the program is loaded. You know, when you launch your app, it's got to be pulled from somewhere. Or when you run an application, when you run your browser or whatever, it was sitting there in, out in storage. It's brought into the store. It's sitting there. And that's where it actually gets executed. So that's RAM. Where it got loaded from would be the hard drive or the flash drive. Or if you're using a purely network-based client, you know, it's supposed to load all of its information over the network. For a while, uh, you know, people were trying to sell companies on the ideas that you would not buy computers with hard drives. They would load absolutely everything from servers. And uh, that never really took off. But that's the idea. So we're going to play way back just for a second. All right, y'all pretty much all know what a trackball is. It's a little ball that you spin in order to control your mouse, uh, to control your cursor, rather than using a mouse. I just want you to see the first one. Yes, that is, in fact, a bowling ball. So, people wanted the ability to, con you know, smoothly control, could give X, Y values, you know, X being horizontal and Y, and y being the vertical values on a screen. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> so, uh, the first arcade ball. <laughs> yeah, the first arcade games. <laughs> there was an old game called Missile Command where you had to, you know, send a ball across the screen and shoot the missiles that would come to the U.S. Can you imagine the exercise you'd get if you were using, you know, a bowling ball as your track ball? So, anyways, but you can kind of see underneath what's going on. As it spins this way, it's spinning this rotor here. And this rotor has holes punched in it, then light shining through it, and there's a sensor that detects how fast that rotor's spinning. And then if you spin it this way, the same thing does, and so that way you can move the, the mouse horizontally, not the mouse, the cursor, horizontally or vertically. And if you spin it diagonally, hopefully both wheels are engaged. So, you know, in a mouse, the, the mice that we used all in the 80s and in the 90s were essentially just trackballs turned upside down. Yeah. But they weren't always like that. Here we go. Primitive looking little device. Late 60s at Stanford. Doug Engelbart's group. Someday I just need to walk you through Doug Engelbart's accomplishments <coughs> and how much of what we expect from computers he originated. But anyways, the same idea. Here's a wooden mouse. It's got one button. It's got two wheels on it rather than a, than a ball underneath it. And you spin it one way, and one wheel is triggered. You spin it another wheel, another wheel is triggered. Obviously, that doesn't actually you know, flow as well as one with a mouse ball does underneath it. And then if you had one with a mouse ball underneath it, you know that it got gunked up and stuff like that. And so we all love our laser mice. All righty. Old, 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 old days. Night, the late 1940s. Just about all the computer stuff that we do today, that we use today, kind of originated from uh, research efforts that were done both in Britain and in the United States. And in the United States, they were built for the wartime effort to calculate tra trajectories for artillery and stuff like that. 
because if you had, you know, these guns that were supposed to shoot this heavy projectile and hit a target that was, you know, over a mile and a half away, it's not like in the days of the pirates where people were just pouring, you know, gunpowder into a cannon and shooting it. You had to know exactly what angle, you know, exactly how much propellant. You had to know, you know, if there was prevailing winds or whatever. And so they actually had books full of, uh, decide that that thing is 1.2 miles away and, you know, look up all these other factors, how heavy the shells are that we're firing, and then you'd look them up and then you would use that much propellant in order to shoot it. And so big, thick books, actually. Computers were actually invented to print out tables of information, even the ones in the, uh, in the 1800s. The, the purely mechanical ones. So this one is one of the very first programmable electronic computers. Programmable meaning that it's got a store which holds the program that it's running on. And it's got memory that it can read to and write from to store its data. Now the memory back then, we did not have hard drives. Instead, you know, you've heard of vacuum tubes. What is a vacuum tube? Well, it's effectively just a really fancy light bulb. This would be memory. These, you know, a light bulb is just either on or off. But you could make a vacuum tube that supported, you know, individual states between on and off. Like you might make a vacuum tube that supported 10 different states. So it could support, you know, up to 10, you know, the digits of our decimal counting system. So this one here, it could multiply two 10 digit numbers 40 times a second. That's 40 operations a second. That's really fast compared to somebody who is having to, you know, write things out by hand, or at best, having a mechanical calculator to work things out. That was one form of memory. Um, a weirder one would have been uh, You had tubes filled with mercury, and you effectively had a microphone at one end and a speaker on the other. I may have these vice versa, but uh, you'd send a pulse down it. The microphone at the other end would pick up the pulse and then come back down here and send it again. So you were maintaining constant information, you know, circling through this mercury, and the speed of uh, sound through mercury, mercury is a lot slower than it is through water. So you could actually store numbers in a tube full of mercury, as long as there was power going on. And if you wanted to modify those, you know, you'd wait until, you know, the signal had propagated all the way to the microphone, and then you would not let it speak the same pulse back through it, but a different pulse. Getting a little bit more modern. These things, drum memory. Kind of odd, but if you look up the history of recording media, like audio tape, the Germans were way ahead of anybody else in making good audio tape. Sounds silly, but they were. Um, so the idea of audio tape was that you had a thin plastic film that was impregnated with, uh, you know, iron oxide materials, and then you can magnify, uh, you can magnetize parts of them to store a signal. Well, a drum was if you had a great big cylinder surrounded with pieces of audio tape, magnetic tape. And then you'd crank this thing up to a really high speed, and then if you wanted to write numbers to it, there would be something that would write an audio signal to it. So they were big devices, and they really did not hold much compared to modern devices. But until people started using flash drives in their computers, this idea of the spinning magnetic media existed in everybody's computer, first in the form of floppy disks, and then in the hard drives. And if you ever broke open a hard drive, you know that it's a series of platters. 
metal platters, and then there's some kind of magnetic media on it. Even the idea of CD you know, is a similar one, except the, you know it's lasers burning holes in, a, in an aluminum or gold substrate. A uh, point to mention about this one. Slide back here. Notice these gals here. Whenever you had uh, articles about the first computers in the late 40s, you know, they always had the pictures of the manly looking engineers, and maybe there were some women you know, standing around, and you'd kind of assume, well, the guys made the computers, and those women were secretaries or something like that. It's funny, but the engineers who built the devices were men trained as electrical engineers. There were not very many female electrical engineers back then. But the programmers responsible for actually figuring out how to make all that stuff work were women. They were all, um, you know, PhD students or teachers from Harvard or, or the like. And um, they had to e effectively invent the first programming languages. So they could do things with the, the hardware that uh, that the guys had no idea. They, they just got the specs. And if you ever see the chance to watch on Netflix or something, a, a, a movie called Computer Rosies, you'll be interested to watch it, how uh, the first, first programmers were effectively women. And that was also true if you go back into the 1800s and talk about Charles Babbage's programmable device. But it's interesting, even when I was first going to school in the late 1980s, the division of people in computer science programmers was still like 60 to 40 men and women. But then it got to the point, for some reason, and I have no idea why, where it's like only 10% you know, are women, 90% men. And there's no reason for that, absolutely no reason for that, um, you know, except for cultural, you know, in what people get interested in. So if you are a woman, you can take comfort in the fact that the first programmers were women, and that's not an exaggeration. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is, notice how this is programmed. Cables connecting one thing to another. That'd be a real drag to have to program. It's much cooler to be able to type something in, you know, and have it compile, rather than hooking up various, uh, you know, things. Let's uh, go one more little blast from the past. In the early 70s, you'd be looking through popular mechanics or whatever, and there'd be an ad that says, build your own computer. And so you'd get some parts, and you'd whip out your soldering gun, and if you hooked it all up, and eventually it would get, build this. Whoa, I got a computer. Well, it doesn't have a monitor. It doesn't have a keyboard. If you wanted to enter programming instructions into it, you would flip all these switches, and then you would flip a fi final switch that was kind of like hitting the enter key. All right, I've typed in one letter into my computer. Then you flip all the switches again to a different setting and you flip that final one and okay, now I've typed a second letter into my computer. And you could laboriously enter a sequence of instructions and then you'd flip another switch that would set it into a run mode and then it would make the lights, you know, flicker in patterns. Dude, I'm programming a computer. That's all it did. But it was a computer, you know, it was capable of performing, you know, math at, you know, thousands of instructions a second. It just really was not super useful to anybody who didn't want to just watch a series of lights flicker. So in the early 70s, the mid-70s, there were uh, groups called Homebrew Computer Clubs. And those were people who were trying to take things like this things that you could build just from a couple hundred dollars worth of parts and it actually turned them into something that you'd want to play with by uh, creating the circuitry that would be able to display characters on a television set you know and uh, hooking up some kind of floppy drive to it you know so there were kits you could buy that would expand the functionality of this thing and from that era you know it's when the Apple II's the Apple computers the, the uh, and Bill Gates, and the basic programming language, you know, 
the, the fundamentals of pretty much what all we play with today was created, you know, by people in the 70s, just doing it as a hobby, just doing it for fun. Although you can be pretty sure that Bill Gates in particular, when he was doing it for fun, he knew that he was going to make a lot of money doing it too. Okay. That's enough way back. So, let's see. So what is software? Software is the program. People break it up into different categories, but by and large, it's enough to say that there's application software and then there's system software. Application apps, that's the name for them now. What are apps? Apps are the things that you download on your computer that you do stuff with. You play games with them, you, you take notes with them, you play music with them. You know. It's something that does something useful. It has some application. Well, then what's system software? System software is, you know, the operating system of it. Right now, you know, when I'm sitting here and it's just letting me type, you know, things, click things like this, you don't really consider that an app. I didn't download this stuff. You know, I didn't download the thing that lets me type on, on it, you know. It runs underneath it. It's the operating system and it's also the programs that control the operating system. So when you get a computer, it's probably got a word processor installed on it. If not, you go and buy, you know, Word or download Word or something like that. It's got browsers on it, like Chrome and IE. You may get spreadsheets like Excel or whatever. You may get paint programs. Those are all applications. I did not mean to click that. I meant to click that. But then you also have, you know, the programs that control the computer. You don't think of a backup and restore functionality as an application. It's programmed the same way. You know, it's still computer language, you know, but it's just considered at a, at a different level. So pretty much what we're going to all be doing is working on application software. We're not going to be doing anything that, you know, helps you manage the computer, that changes the settings of the hard drive or whatever. But we can think of those uh, as the two broad categories. And the systems programmers are people who deal with the, the lower level. And the application developers are the people who deal with the stuff that makes lots of money because people like to play with them or to use them. Let's All right, so simple program logic. P people use different words to talk about logics. One word you may hear is algorithm or program. Um, effectively, it's just a recipe for controlling the computer. We've all used programs before, and we've just used recipes, even if it's just as easy as open packet, pour into bowl, add water, microwave for one minute. That's a program, except it's a program controlling you rather than a computer. So say we had a recipe that looks something like this. Get a bowl, stir, add two eggs, add seven pounds flour, bake at 350 degrees for 45 minutes, eat. Okay, that's a really bad program. That's a really bad recipe. For one thing, you're stirring before you add the eggs and before you add the flour. The uh, the seven pounds of flour looks highly suspect. I don't, you know. Anyways, that's just a totally bad program. But it's a recipe for. It's supposed to control a process. The process is cooking whatever we were supposed to be cooking here, cake or whatever. What if the instructions did not even make this much sense? All right. So if you're opening Betty Crocker and she said, add a good of You wouldn't know what that was. It'd probably be a good idea just to, uh, to flip to the next recipe. We, we would not be successful doing this. In computer terms, that's what's known as a syntax error. It's when what is being communicated to us 
is just simply simply incomprehensible to whatever is supposed to be controlled by this recipe. In this case, me the cook, or you the cook. So this is poor syntax. For one thing, the, uh, the, these are just not words. It's like somebody typed them with their fingers in the wrong keys or whatever. Yeah. It could be that the words all make sense, but they still doesn't have any meaning. Like add, you know, shower faucet, teaspoon, you know, hashtag. <laughs> okay, those are all words that mean something, but they still don't make any sense in this context. For one thing, we're not de doing anything with shower faucets or whatever, but these are all words in the English language. It still doesn't make a lick of sense. That's another example of syntax error. Okay, so then the programmer, the... Uh, comes along, realizes that the instructions are incomprehensible, and they modify them to say, add three teaspoon of salt. Okay, great. Now that's not a syntax error. Now that is comprehensible. But the instructions still don't make any sense as a whole. They do things in the wrong order, and they probably have other mistakes. This seven pounds of flour is really highly suspect. So the syntax is correct, but the logic is wrong. Let me go back here and say syntax errors, incomprehensible instructions. And then there are logic errors. The uh, book, the text, the online text that we're following calls them semantic errors. That's when the instructions are comprehensible, but they do not give you what you want. If we're trying to make a cake here, the cake, this, this is totally wrong. We should not start stirring before we add the ingredients. And in terms of a program, you know, say you were trying to calculate, you know, determine whether to turn the heating element of your heater on or off based on a temperature, and then you reverse the logic so that it turned the heater on when it was hot inside, and it turned the heater off when it got cold inside. The code is all perfect. It's perfectly good syntax. It's not causing the computer to crash or anything, but it's turning the heater on only when it's hot inside and it's turning it off when it gets cold. That's stupid logic. It's bad logic. So that's a semantic error. So you have your syntax errors and then you have your semantic errors. Both are failures of your instructions to deliver what you want, which is a series of commands to get the result that you want, whether it's making a cake out of instructions or making your program calculate payroll or, you know, display a game or whatever. So we're not going to be making recipes in here, which is a good thing because I'm not a cook, but we will be talking about programming. A simple example of programming is when you write something in what's known as pseudocode. Pseudocode is a code that's written for a human to be able to read it and understand what they would need to do in order to turn it into a computer language. It's not in any specific programming language. You don't write pseudocode in Python or C++ or BASIC or whatever language you've ever heard of. Just like this recipe, this could tell a human what to do, but it couldn't tell a machine what to do. If you were making an industrial cake baking device, you know, that would produce Twinkies at the end of the process, you would have to be very specific about what controlled the machines in order to, you know, of the process. This would not cut it. This is a, a recipe is more like pseudocode. So what could pseudocode be for doubling a number? We want to take a number and we want to put it in. We want to let the user put in a number and then we want to multiply it by two. I'm going to expand these two lines here to their own slide here before we go on. Okay, so syntax error. Something that is not understandable to the system. Can't even begin to run. An example of that is if you're using a programming language and you misspell the word syntax. Sitmax. 
Let's correct that. Yeah, you, you misspell the keywords that are required. You're trying to read from the disk drive, but you don't type in read. You type in read, R-E-D. You know, that kind of thing. Spelling errors. Or if you put symbols in the wrong place. Or in Python, it's so picky that if you put tabs in the wrong place, or you don't put enough tabs in or whatever, it's, it won't run. Those are syntax errors. So the system can't even begin to run. Or if it started to run, then halfway through, it may stop running. I guess understandable is not good. Good English. Okay, at least it didn't underline that. Just can't be understood. The syntax is wrong. You know, the English syntax, um, you start saying the words backwards. You know, one difference between a lot of uh, Romance languages and the English language is that uh, in those languages, the adjectives and the adverbs tend to follow the noun. So you don't say the red tractor, you say the tractor red. If you do that in English, then people are going to think that you're somewhat odd. You know, please go get me the Chevy Green. What? No. Oh, you were supposed to go get the green Chevy. You know, just uh, it's perfectly good syntax in the language that it uh, was intended, but then when you translate it in the other language. It doesn't make sense until you actually make it match the syntax. So then the semantic errors. The syntax is correct, but does not produce the correct results. You're trying to write a payroll program and it, it winds up printing out zeros on everybody's check. Yeah. Nobody's going to be happy with that. All right. So back to pseudocode. We want to double a number, but we're not going to write it in any specific language. So input my number. Set my answer equal to my number multiplied by 2, and then output my answer. There we go. That's pseudocode. It kind of looks like a programming language, but it's not. These, some of these words may work in some programming languages, but there's no, no computer system where you can type these three things in and then have it actually work. But we can understand conceptually, input my number. What does input mean? It means you know, some way of putting information into the computer. This kind of implies that it's supposed to be a number. Why is it capitalized like that? Well, mm -hmm. whoever wrote the pseudocode decided it needed to be capitalized like that. And there's kind of a reason. But Then set my answer equal to my number multiplied by 2. And this is some kind of mathematical formula. This part is what's known as an expression, but it's not expressed very clearly. You don't typically write out entire English words in order to show multiplication. But what it's just to say is that there's going to be something over here, and then it's going to get evaluated, and then the word set means that the result is going to be stored here. Now that, this word my number, and this thing my answer, are what are known as variables. They hold chunks of data. I think we did uh, a little bit of a program last Wednesday where we had a variable. So variables can hold names, they can hold numbers, and you know, they can any piece of information that the computer can hold can be stored in a variable. You can have simple variables that just hold one number, or you can have more complex data types that contain a lot of specific information in a single spot. And then output my answer. Output would mean display. Now this isn't a really great program. If I was going to type this in line by line, converting it to Python, then it wouldn't really be too cool. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's go ahead and open up idle. So come over here. Start, type I-D-L-E. And then do file new. Make sure you get to a blank screen before you start typing what we're going to do next. So now I'm going to translate that pseudocode 
here. Let me slam this on this side. Strictly line per line into Python. I'm going to change the variable names just a little bit to make them easier to type in. I'm going to make them all lowercase. My answer, excuse me, my number equals input. And I'm putting spaces where you don't need them. You can leave off every space in that sentence if you wanted to. And then my answer equals my number asterisk times multiplied by 2. Now when I'm reading this, would I say or would I uh, want you to type in an asterisk? I'm probably going to say times. Why? That's a little childish, you know, 3 times 4. And I don't know. Your way is to say 3 multiplied by 4. However, multiplied by is like four syllables and two words, whereas times is just one word. So in the future, if I type this, if I say this line aloud, I would say my answer equals my number times 2. And we will all understand what that means. And then output my answer. Well, there's no output command in Python, but there's a print command. All right, now I need to save it. Or I could just run it, but it's going to ask me to save it anyways. So I'm going to choose File, Save As. And remember, don't save it into the guts of the system where it says Program Files 86, Python 32. You can, you can uh, damage your Python installation to the point where it will no longer run by saving things down here. Instead, go to your desktop and make a folder or save it to your flash drive or something. I have a uh, folder down here called CIT1113. I'm just going to call this one double, D-U-B-L-E dot P-Y. Then when I run it, here it comes up. I don't even know what to do. It's just sitting there. It's a blank screen with a flashing cursor. That's not too great. Now, since I just wrote the program, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to type in a number. So I'm going to type in 12. And it displays, as a result, 1212. 12. Is that really what I wanted when I typed in 12 and I wanted it to be multiplied by 2? No, not really. So the program really has kind of two flaws. One is that it's just not telling you what you're supposed to be doing. There's no information prompting the user to let them know that they're supposed to type something in. And the other is that it's not behaving correctly. If I run it again and I type in a word <laughs> instead of a number, like Joe, it's going to print out Jojo. That's kind of odd. So we need to fix two things. One is we need to tell the user what to do, which is to enter a number. And then we need to convert this data into a format that it can actually do math on. Right now, what they type in and whatever is stored in my number is not being treated like a number. So when it's multiplied by 2, it's actually just, you know, if it was the word Joe, it becomes Jojo. If it's the, num the characters 1, 2, it becomes 1, 2, 1, 2. Now, that's kind of a quirk of the Python language. But we will fix that so that it actually treats it like a number rather than just a word. Right now, it's being treated as a word. A fancier term for that is a string. A string is a series of characters that is not treated as a number. We want it to be a number. Okay, so come up to the top, and let's add a print statement that tells the user what we want them to do. Please enter a number. Now, once we get that number, we need to convert it before we try to do math on it. And this is true of a lot of languages, not just Python. Whatever you type into the screen is whatever you read off the internet will often be considered a string. It's a series of characters, but then you have to turn it in to a number in order to do math on it. Now, some programming languages give you shortcuts for doing that. But we're going to do this. My number 
equals I and T parentheses my number. What that line does is there's a function built into Python which takes a string, whatever had been stored into there by typing, and it does whatever magic is necessary so that the computer now understands that it's a number. Specifically, it's an integer. INT stands for integer, meaning this is only going to work if it's a whole number. If the user types in 12.5, that line is going to crash, but if they type in 12, it's going to work. Now, we could make it work for numbers with decimal points as well by changing that from INT to another word. Okay, so I believe we fixed those two errors. The only other thing that might be nice is if we told the user what they were seeing. They type in two, we print out four, but they don't really know what happened. So why don't we give them a little bit more of an explanation and say, print, I'm gonna change this line, this is my answer. I'm gonna add some stuff before that variable name. So right here, I'm gonna add two quotes and a comma, and inside those quotes, I'm gonna put that number doubled is. So now when I run it, please enter a number, two, that number doubled is four. Okay, it's a much better program than it was a few minutes ago. Why is it better? Well, for one thing, it, it, uh, it actually does math, and the other is it's telling the user what they should type in and what the answer means. So there's a few more things that I would like to do to this program before I would consider it something I'd be willing to turn into the teacher. We need to put some comments in it. Up at the top, you want to put your name and the date and then the description of the program, whether the description of the program is just this is assignment 12 or whether it actually explains what the program does. So you would put your name up at the top, the date, if you want to be thorough, you could put the class, and then what does the program do? Asks for the user, enter a number and then displays that number doubled. Good enough. This is what's known as a comment block. You're right, I'm a year in the past. <laughs> you see, now that I no longer write checks, I don't get my brain programmed to write the correct year until about halfway through. June, I'll probably still be doing 2016. So anyways, there we go. This is what's known as a comment block. A comment block is a series of comments that gives you information about that programming file. Why are these called a comment block? Well, each line here is what's known as a comment. This is the comment symbol, and it differs on a language-by-language -language basis. If you become a Java or C programmer, you will see comments that start with two slashes. That doesn't work in this language, but you'll see that all over the place in Java and C programs. Other languages have their own comment symbol. This is what's known as a single line comment. A single line comment is one that starts with a hashtag, pound sign, and a comment is something that you type in but that the program ignores. I could type in anything up here and it's not going to stop the program from running. I could even put in commands like, please turn me off, I hate computers, whatever, you know. It's not going to print that. It, that line is just a comment. It's for the human to read. The computer completely ignores it. That can be useful when you're stuck on something. What if this wasn't the correct formula for doubling? Or more importantly, what if we wanted to modify it so it would accept fractional numbers like 2.5 rather than just 2. 
you can comment a line of code out by putting the hashtag in front of it or whatever the comment symbol is. That makes it ignore that line and you can replace that with a line that would actually work. I'm going to undo that for now, but then we're going to come back and we're going to change this so that it works on, uh, on floating point numbers as well as integers. Okay, I'm going to delete that. That's kind of stupid. So comments are not only good just for describing what the program is, they're also good for describing the parts of the programmer, parts of the program. So here, we're going to put a comment above that print statement that says, get input from user. That's pretty vague, but that's enough. Why don't we give a better one? Get a number from the user. And now, above this line that said int mine number, I'm going to add another comment. Convert the input into an integer. Because at this point, it's what's known as a string. It's just a series of characters. Can't do math on a series of characters. You saw what happened when I typed in Joe. It became Jojo. You know, it is. Can't do math on it. When I typed in 12, it printed out 12, 12. Okay, and then the last comment we're going to add is down here above my answer is equal to, well, maybe we'll do two things. Double the number. And then above that final print statement, our comment is going to be print the results. Notice that these four comments kind of look like pseudocode. They're just English descriptions. I could actually write pseudocode, and, or you could hand in pseudocode to me that consisted of those four lines. Those lines are just as valid as these lines are. These lines look a little more techy because they have words like input and output and stuff like that. But we could do the same thing. We could change this to the word input some up here and the word output down here. But you get the idea. So the comments usually have a one-to-one -one relationship with what the pseudocode might have been. There's just an English description of what happened here. Okay, so I'm going to run the program, but I'm going to cause it to crash. I'm going to type in a number that is not a whole number. Enter a number. I'm not telling them what kind of number, so it's perfectly reasonable they might expect to be able to type in 12.3. And then it blows up. If we look at it carefully, it tells us what line number it crashed on, which is line number 12. And it gives us an error message, which is pretty incomprehensible at first glance. Invalid literal for int with base 10. Okay, all that's telling us is that it could not turn 12.3 into an integer, which is a whole number. So we're going to fix that. We're going to come over here, and where it says int my number, we're going to comment that line out, just in case we ever wanted to put it back. And then underneath it, we're going to type in my number is equal to float my number. Now if I type in 12.3, it'll actually work. And it says the number doubled is 24.6. So we have change some pseudocode to programming code. Let's go back to the pseudocode. And I will also wander around and make sure that everybody actually got it working. But looking at this, from now on in this class, if I was going to do something like this, I would probably add a line that said convert my number to either int or float. And then up here where it said input my number, I should display output 
I'm not really big on the word output, although printing really is, you know, sending something to a printer. But I am going to add print, please enter a number. And then down here, I guess I could be consistent and go with the word output or the word print either in one place or the other. So I'm going to change this word output to print. The number doubled is comma my answer, like that. Then it kind of, now, now that matches our code, and it's better pseudocode. It's a little, almost too picky, because the fact that we had to convert my number to a float in order to do the math, that's just a little too picky, because, but overall, this is pretty good pseudocode. So we have kind of defined several words here that we might see over and over and over. Print, input, convert, and set. The set begins the expression, which does the math. I am probably not going to use the word multiplied by 2 in any future pseudocode. Instead, I would say asterisk 2. So I'm going to call this slide doubling a number attempt 1. I'm going to undo those changes that I just made. Then we're going to copy that. Here was our second effort at it. And then let's paste the results of the resulting code. So I'm going to run over here, grab this, and paste it. You can read that, but it's there. You can read it on your screen. So what's the top chunk up here called? Um, yep, that's a comment block. Each line here is a comment. We talked about a single line comment, which is one that starts with a hashtag. There are also multi-line comments. And in this language, a multi-line comment begins and ends with triple quotes, either triple double quotes or triple apostrophes. You don't have to type this in, but like this. This is a comment. It is a really great comment isn't it? Just look at it. Okay, there. So, that's what's known as a multi-line comment. That way I didn't have to start off each line with a symbol. I could just start it off here, and then everything I typed until it found another set of those is considered a comment. In other languages, such as C, C++, and Java, you start a multi-line comment with that thing, and then you could type a whole bunch of things, and then you would end it like that. So occasionally I may throw a multi-line comment in, but usually I'm going to just add uh, the hashtags in front of everything. Alrighty, sir. So a variable. We used two variables in our program. One was called my number and one was called my answer. Did we really need to tack the word my in front of either one of those? No. But what is a variable? Let's give it a, a techie definition. A variable is a named place in memory to store data. You know, the computer has, you know, all these gigabytes of information, and somewhere stored in it, after I typed in 12.3, is a series of numbers 12.3 but I don't want to have to know the exact address 
which bytes out of the billions of bytes that the computer has in it holds that 12.3. And in most languages, you don't worry about directly addressing. You know, they don't even allow that anymore because you, you most likely would try to crash. It would crash the computer if you tried to access it by, you know, addressing specific bytes. You know, nowadays you're supposed to let the uh, the program manage its own memory. So, variable, you mean you can change it its value, is a named place in memory. It's got a name, like my answer or my number, to store data. So a variable has three components. It's got a name, example, my number. It's got a type. My number started off as a string, but then we converted it first to an int with that int command, and then we turned it into a float. So we've seen three different types so far. String, int, or float. A string is a series of characters. It's not treated as numeric data, even if it's got numbers in it. An int is a whole number, and a float is a number that has a decimal point. So it's got a name, and it's got a type, and it's got a value. <laughs> the assignment is when you use the equal sign to put a number or a value into another place. We used that in a couple places. Here we used the equal sign to assign a value into my number from keyboard input. Here we turn that number into a floating point number and we assigned that back into the same variable. It could have been assigned into a different variable. Could, variable names are chosen by you. They can be pretty much anything within a, a few rules. You, we, we could call that Fred. Now is Fred a good variable name? No, but it's a functional variable name. It does work. Now Fred holds, holds the result of converting that string to a number. And when I want to calculate two times Fred, it gets stored in my answer. So the name of it is entirely human picked of the variables. We pick these variables' names. The computer doesn't. The, if you mix up what are known as keywords and variable names, then you can get into trouble. You can get into trouble. The keywords are the things that show up in a different color other than black, like the word print. So I would not want to say print is equal to input or input is equal to three or whatever, because these are words that are reserved for the language. Your variable names should not be the keywords that the language uses or the functions that the computer uses. But other than that, you can call them anything you want. So the assignment is when you use the equal sign to copy a value into a variable. And you can be copying it from what they type in from the keyboard with the input. Examples, x is equal to input, y is equal to int x, z is equal to y times 2. These are three different assignments. The equal sign is what's known as the assignment operator. What if you wanted to compare two numbers? You can't do this. Although it looks like good programming, it won't run. Suppose down here at the bottom, I say, I'm going to delete this. This is a common thing. If my answer equals 12, print a dozen. Whatever. Stupid logic, but that's not going to work. It's going to give us a syntax error. Whether it gives us one at the beginning, before it runs, or when it hits that line during processing, it's invalid syntax. And the reason for that is, and this is true of a lot of languages, not just Python, is that if you're going to do comparison, if you want to check is equal to, you have to use two equal signs. And so I guarantee that that's going to be a point of confusion, not because students are dumb. It's just because we use the same word for two different purposes. A equals three. If A equals three. You know? So, when I'm reading code aloud to you that I want you to type in, I will try to remember to use the word equals equals. 
I will try to remember to say, you know, two equal words to key you in, to cue you in. But if I don't, then you'll just have to go back and remember that if it's got the word if in front of it, you have to use two equal signs. Otherwise, it will not compile. And if you mix them up, if you do this, a is equal, equal to 10. If A is equal to 3, both of these lines are wrong. So if you're assigning a value, you use a single equal. If you're comparing a value, you use two equal signs. All right, that's about enough. Let's create a Dropbox for this, and we will call it a day.